todos. Um, hoje vamos... Não, in English. <laughs> I have to switch. So, today we're going to see some random graph models and uh, the, the most classical ones to see how, how they work and uh, what we're going to do uh, with, uh, with them. So, the first very well-known random graph model is the Erdos-Rheny model. So, let's see uh, how it works. So, first, what is a random graph model? Uh, a very general definition is that a random graph model is simply a collection of graphs, so the collection should be finite or countable, and on that collection of graphs, you consider a probability distribution on the collection. That's a random graph model, okay? So you define a set of graphs and with which probability each graph can appear and the total sum of, the, of those probabilities should be one, obviously. So the erdos rheny model is the, the simplest random graph model. It was introduced uh, at the end of the 50s independently uh, by Erdos and, and Rheny, so we call it the erdos rheny uh, model. And in fact, it has two different variants. Uh, one variant is called the GNM model and the second variant is called the GNP. I will explain the difference. So in the GNM model, you fix the number of nodes N and you fix the number of edges M. So you consider the collection of all simple graphs. So a simple graph is just a graph that is binary, undirected, with no self-loops, no multiple edges, okay? So you consider the collection of all simple graphs with n nodes and m edges. And on this collection of graphs, you take uniform distribution. So every graph in that collection can appear with the same probability as any other. So in, this, in that collection, you have m uh, oh, do yes, I say that, sorry. You have capital N, choose capital M, different graphs where capital N is the total number of possible edges. So small n, n minus one, choose two. That's the possible number of uh, edges that you can have in a simple uh, undirected graph uh, with n nodes. And so the occurrence probability of each of these graphs is simply one over the total number of elements of, on that collection. Okay, so it's, uh, that's for the first variant. And in the second variant called GNP, there you say that uh, you consider the collection of all simple graphs <coughs> which are generated by two parameters. So N is the number of nodes again, but now P is a parameter between zero and one. And that's the probability of connection of any two nodes. So if you take two nodes at, at random, uh, if you take two nodes at random, you have a probability P to connect them. And in this case, of course, the total number of edges will be random. Okay, it will be uh, not fixed. So uh, each graph GNP is such that the adjacency matrix A, so the adjacency matrix is the matrix that contains at IJ, uh, at the IJ entry, the value one if ij are linked by an edge in the graph and zero otherwise. So this matrix contains i id random variables. So I only consider i smaller than j. So I look at the upper diagonal uh, triangular part of the matrix, or the I have repetitions. So these are i id random variables. They take only the value zero and one, zero or one, so it's Bernoulli distribution, and the parameter of the Bernoulli it's p. Okay, so why are there two different uh, variants of the um, of the of the same model? Because that variant is more easy to handle from a probabilistic point of view, but that variant is more easy to simulate graphs. If you want to simulate a graph, uh, it's boring to look at every possible pair and draw a random variable zero or one. Uh, but it's more easy to just decide for a number of edges and throw them at random on all the possible places. So this is a more efficient description and this is a more probabilistic one. So this is uh, what Erdos-Rheny model 
look like you have Erdős-Rényi random graphs here of the type GNP with n equal 15 nodes and p uh, varying from 0 0.05 in that case. So that's what we call very sparse. You don't see many uh, edges in that graph. And then you increase here the value of p, which corresponds in fact to the density of uh, your uh, random graph up to 0 0.9. And you see here that you have almost a complete, uh, complete graph. And if we were to take p equal 1 exactly, then we would have a complete graph. So that's an exercise to uh, give to Florentia. No, I'm joking. Uh, you have n and p fixed. You can consider a graph generated under the GNP model. You could compute the average number of edges in this graph. That's quite easy to do, but we will see the, the answers of all these uh, in, uh, in following slides. If you take M, um, capital M positive, what is the probability that the graph is of size M? Also, you could try to give the law of the random variable di, which uh, is the degree of the node i in that model, and deduce the expectation uh, of uh, the average value I recommend that after the class, you go back to this exercise, but you see that those are in what follows. Uh, I think I already said that, but let's uh, mention it again. Uh, how can you simulate a large elder Schwenny on a random graph? So in principle, it would be enough to generate n, n minus 1 minus uh, divided by two random variables with distribution uh, Bernoulli with parameter p. But when n is large and you let p equal to pn decrease with n, so most of the time uh, to, to make realistic graph, we take the probability of connection to be of the order 1 over n, because in this way, uh, the average number of uh, uh, edges that we see in the graph, it scales like n, the number of nodes, and not n squares. And that's more reasonable to fit real value the graphs, observed graphs. So when you do that, when p is very small, if you have to draw all those random variables, that's very inefficient because most of the time you draw zero, you don't put any edge at that position, and so that's very inefficient. So a more efficient procedure would be to simulate the number m of the number m of edges that is present in the graph. And in fact, it's easy. That's part of the answer. Um, of the of the previous slide okay it's here the total number uh, of edges in your graph that the sum over ij of the values aij because aij is one when there's an edge so if you look at that here we say that these are aij they are random variables that are iid with distribution Bernoulli of parameter p. So the sum of them, this will be a binomial distribution with n, n minus 1 divided by 2 for the first parameter, which is the number of uh, values here in this sum, and the probability of each of these uh, random variable is p. So we see that uh, it's uh, easy to obtain the number of uh, edges in a GNP graph. It's random. It's just uh, a binomial distribution with those parameters. So you can draw this randomly. And then you want to, you will simply just draw the positions uh, of the m uh, different edges. And if p is really small, that m uh, on average it's really uh, not um, of the order n square, it's more of the order n. So by just uh, randomly sampling pairs ij, ij where you will put these positions, you are gaining uh, inefficiency.
So the, the computational complexity uh, of doing this is just capital O of n plus uh, the number of uh, edges, so that uh, random add m, so instead of uh, capital O of n square. So some properties of the of a graph. So I, I put um, this uh, uh, this uh, what uh, what is my notation? Sorry, I call capital uh, call GNP. This is the the model, uh, the, and when I take one random graph in that model, I put a, a G a normal G. Okay, that's the difference of notation. So let's take a graph generated under the model uh, Cal GNP, so a random graph of the Erdos-Rini type under the GNP uh, variant, then uh, we can uh, easily see that the degree of the node uh, is also uh, a binomial distribution with parameter n minus 1 and p. So if you remember correctly uh, the first uh, theoretical um, class that we had, uh, we uh, saw that di, the degree of node i, which is the number of neighbors of i in the graph, this is simply the sum over j of the values a, i, j. And I could sum over the rows or of over the columns in an undirected graph that's the same. So here again, you have independent random variables, all with the same Bernoulli distribution, and you have n minus 1. Uh, such variables because you take j different from i. So that gives you that binomial distribution. And by the law of large numbers, if you take uh, the average value and uh, you divide by n minus 1, so okay, d bar, it's not average, sorry, uh, with that notation, it should be uh, simply uh, the sum, okay? Maybe I should change that notation. Huh? I will correct that because that's not intuitive. So if d bar is the sum of the di, then a d, by, a d bar divided by n minus 1 by a simple... Uh, ah, no, 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 no. I'm wrong. So d bar, sorry, clearly 1 over n. But uh, then... Uh, this is 1 over n, sum over i, sum over j, i. If I want to apply the law of large number, I really need to divide by 1 over n minus 1 again, okay, to have the correct ordering. Sorry, so the notation are of the time uh, when I see uh, a typo in these slides, it's because I'm wrong, because I've been uh, teaching that for a while and so most of the typos should be corrected by now, but okay, it, always, it can always happen, okay? So, um, applying a simple law of large numbers, we can see that this converges to the expectation of that, which is simply uh, p, which means that the average degree in a Erdos-Rheny random graph, it's uh, almost equal to p times n. So, you see that uh, uh, the average degree of any node is p times n. And in particular, if you look at the expectation of di, so it's the expectation of a binomial random variable, so it's just n minus 1 times p, you can see that it's of the order n times p, when n is large and, uh, and p is small. And, um, okay, that's the same. And when n goes to infinity and p goes to zero, if we take p uh, to go to zero uh, of the order lambda over n with some lambda positive, so p decreases to zero uh, with the, the form lambda over n, then we know that the distribution, the binomial distribution b n minus 1 p is approximated by a Poisson distribution, a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. So binomial and Poisson distribution are light tail distribution. And that's one of the problems of the erdos rheny random graph, because in the first theoretical lecture, I told you that real-world networks, they tend to have heavy-tailed 
degree distribution with herbs appearing. Herbs are degrees with large uh, are nodes with large degrees. So this fact that the f we have a binomial, which is approximately a Poisson distribution, makes it unsuited uh, to fit. Uh, okay. Uh, this Erdős Schreni model, it's very well known from the mathematical point of view. Uh, there are a lot of results about phase transition when P goes to zero and increases to infinity, the appearance of a giant component, etc. But, uh, so it's very nice mathematical model, model from a statistical point of view, because of what I just said, it's completely useless. Uh, so, uh, since I'm a statistician, I will switch to something else. And uh, the first thing that people have looked at is uh, focusing on the degree distribution. So I told you in the, in the last class that degree distribution was quite important. It's only uh, a partial descriptor of the, the graph, but it already captures some of the information, but remember that I showed you two graphs that had the same degree dis distribution and they didn't look like at all, okay? But okay, it, that captures something. So the first idea uh, that people had to go beyond this erdos rainy model that is too simple was to consider the degree distribution and try to model it in some way. So. Here we go to scale-free or power law distribution. So I told you that very briefly in the first class. Many real-world networks are such that their degree distribution follows a power law. What is a power law? This is something like that. You look at the probability that the degree of node i is equal to a certain value k, and this is of the order 1 over k to the power gamma. So that decreases, but with heavy tails, which makes that uh, there's some non-null probability that you have very large values that appear. So here, C is just a normaliz normalizing constant, and gamma is the exponent of that power law. Okay? So um, ju just a, a few comments here. Um, at the, at the beginning of the year 2000 something, uh, a phys physicist um, uh, had papers where they, where they look at many different uh, real uh, networks and they uh, tried to fit a power law distribution on the degree distribution observed on the graphs. And they are uh, disfitted very well and they observed that this exponent gamma is very often between two and three. Okay, and so they said, okay. The real world networks, they are uh, scale free distributed with some exponent gamma between two and three. That's wonderful. Yeah? This position, independent of the specific node? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, okay. I see your point. So, uh, the, the idea is that uh, in, in these things, they look at the DI as IID random variables which they are not because so i uh, added this in the lecture because it was uh, missing you you make me is that uh, i admit to tell you the sum of the degrees in any network it's always equal to twice the number of edges okay you can verify this very easily so you can see that just because of this constraint the di are not at all independent and in fact they are i did not put in these slides because uh, i thought we... uh, the of sequences of integers can be characterized as a distribution of a simple random graph uh, this is the um erdos galai condition. So if at some point you need it, that's a very powerful characterization of uh, what are the exact constraints on the degree sequence of, on the sequence of integers to be uh, realized, to be possibly realized as a sequence of degrees. So of course, the sum has to be even, but there are 
other conditions to be satisfied. And if you take any sequence at random of integer values and make them uh, be even, make the sum be even, most of the time you are not satisfying the erdos galai condition and you cannot realize it as the degree sequence of something. So this is physics approach. Sorry, you are a physicist. I should not, uh, no, no, you are statistical mechanics, so, no? Okay, sorry, uh, I don't bother you again. <laughs> uh, configuration models, uh, okay, so the, the next idea is, okay, the, that power law distribution is a bit, um, is a bit uh, boring and in particular uh, what we will see in the practical session is that uh, this is not constructive. Uh, you cannot generate a random graph with this approach because even if you generate degrees like that, most of the time they won't satisfy erdos galai and then you are not able to construct a random graph with that degree distribution. So what people do is uh, they rely on configuration models. So configuration models are still based on this idea that we focus on the degree distribution of the graph and now um, there are different approaches. So we, we define random graph models using only the distribution of the degrees of the nodes and in the first approach so what we saw, we, we look at the power law of degrees, so we consider random graphs with n nodes such that d1 up to dn are iid according to a power law. That's a crude approximation of reality because the di cannot be iid in practice and that's not constructive. Then you can do something else. You can consider a model with fixed degrees. So you consider a sequence of integers that can be the, the degree sequence of a graph and you consider the model which I denote by FD for fixed degree with the parameter is that sequence of n integers value. So that's the collection of all graphs on n nodes which have exactly that sequence of degrees D and you provide this collection with uniform probability. So you consider all possible graphs that have exactly that uh, sequence of degrees and you put uniform probability on that and this is a model that we can simulate we will, you will see that um, in the next slide i'm closing that because uh, i uh, un courant d'air i don't know what's the the word in english but okay anyway and model which you can realize independent edges you cannot realize independent degrees but you can realize independent edges. and you ask the the distribution to be Bernoulli again because this is zero one so this cannot be uh, anything else than Bernoulli but then you make the parameter here pij depend on ij. So the difference with erdos schrenyi was that that value p was constant for erdos schrenyi And here you make it be specific for the pair you, of nodes you are looking at. So you set pij to be proportional to the product of the degrees, di times di, dj. So what does it mean? In the, if the degree is large, then you have a, a larger proportion to be connected to the other one. So that makes sense. Here you choose C to be a... are between 0 and 1 because you need to make them between 0 and 1. So for instance, you could, you could take that choice, but you could take other choices. It's up to you. So let's see in practice... Uh, how it works. So uh, in practice uh, what we can say is that in this fixed degree model all the graphs have exactly the sequence of degrees d. 
so you don't change it, uh, it's uh, fixed. Uh, in the power law model, we start by drawing a sequence of degrees according to this power law. Then we consider a graph which has this sequence of fixed degrees. So here again, it's fixed in some sense, but you cannot realize it. You cannot draw from it. And in the random degree uh, model, then the degrees are only approach. Uh, what does that mean? The degrees are only approach subsequently. This, okay, this phrase, this sentence makes no sense. What I wanted to write is uh, the degrees are only uh, approximately equal to uh, to the degrees in the sequence d uh, underscore. So uh, if you look at the expected value of d i in the random degree model, uh, so again the same formula that's the sum over all the j different from i of the expected values of a i j and we say that in that case this is a Bernoulli p i j and so this is d i over some normalizing constant and you need to sum the d j and so the sum of the d j it's twice the um, the number of edges minus d i so you see here that if you choose d i not too large if you choose the constant C, the normalizing constant, approximately equal to uh, twice the number of edges, then, okay, this is approximately equal to uh, di on the first order. But this is only approximate. So in the random degree model, you don't realize exactly uh, the fixed degree, but that's a good approximation and you can uh, write some, uh, some math with that, which can be important. Okay. So, simulation. So, as I already um, said, the power law is not constructive uh, and it's not simply generative because if you draw a sequence di um, of degrees, it's unlikely that uh, it will satisfy the Erdős-Gaillard uh, conditions and it's not achievable as a sequence of degrees of a graph. Uh, the simulation of graphs in the variable degree, so it's random degree model, it's direct since it suffices to draw uh, Bernoulli uh, distribution. So it's not efficient because you have to look at every possible pair of nodes and draw a Bernoulli uh, random variable at that place with uh, a specific parameter pij. So it's quite huge but you can do it and then uh, you you will obtain a graph so you can simulate in the random degree graph uh, a graph but then the the degrees that you obtain they are only approximately the initial sequence and to generate the graphs in the fixed degree uh, sequence model then we can use either the matching algorithm or the rewiring re or switching algorithm. And so these are algorithms that are quite efficient and that are very useful uh, to obtain null models and to make tests. So we're going to see that. Okay, first the, the matching algorithm, it's very simple. So the input of the algorithm is the sequence of degrees you want to uh, realize. And the output is a list of edges. I told you that you can characterize a graph by the list of edges. So you initialize the algorithm by creating a void list of edges and a void list of nodes. And then you will create a fake node list by just looping over all the possible nodes. And while di is larger than one, you uh, take uh, the node list, you concatenate i and you uh, put this in load list and you um, uh, decrease the value of the i uh, by one. And then you create the edge list. So while uh, this node list is not empty, you draw ij uniformly uh, at random and without replacement uh, inside that node list. And then you uh, create the, um, the, the edge list uh, the, you create the edge i, ij and you concatenate it in the edge list. Okay. At the end, so let me let me draw a picture because it's more explicit with uh, a picture.
In fact, what this algorithm is doing, it's only that you have first node, second node, third node. And imagine the degrees are small things like that. So one degree three, and then this one is of degree one, this one would be of degree two, etc. Then what you do with that is that you take a node at random and you consider this stub. You will treat that one and then you, you will remove it. Okay, let's do it that way. In fact, what we do, what you do is that you between those two things, and you remove, you uh, decrease the degree by one. Then again, okay, let's connect that, those ones. Then maybe those ones. Okay. But by doing that, the problem is that maybe you don't create a simple graph because maybe at some point you will do that creating a self loop and maybe at some point uh, you will do that again creating a multiple edge between one and two so when you do that at the end you want uh, to, you need to do a simple graph test if edge list contains loops or multiple edges the output is invalid and you have to restart all again because you cannot just okay um, uh, erase uh, the problems and continue uh, because it has been proven that if you do that you are not sampling uniformly from the set of possible graphs so you are not realizing the exact uh, distribution you aim at so you cannot do that so this matching algorithm it's inefficient because it can run 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 before happening to, uh, to end up with a simple graph. A more efficient algorithm is the rewiring algorithm. In this algorithm, you start with an very different from the first one. In the first one, you only need uh, the degree distribution. So you, you didn't need to already a correct pairing uh, of the nodes, okay? You just start with in the rewiring algorithm, you need to start from a graph, a graph that has the degree sequence that you aim at realizing. And what you will do in this, um, in this algorithm is that you will mix the, the edges. So you start, the input is an edge list, and a certain number of iteration, which is the, the number of times you're going to mix everything. The output will be an edge list. And while you have not reached the total number of iteration, what you do is you choose a first edge. So let's say you want B1. That's an edge in my, in my list. And I pick a second edge, U2, V2. So that's E1, that's E2. And what I will do, very simply, I propose the creation of the, of the edge U1, V2, like that, and like that. I propose that tree. No. Then I replace the white edges by the red edges. Otherwise, uh, if that creates a loop, uh, I don't do that, and I pick up two other uh, edges. So hope that creates uh, a loop uh, or a multiple edge, but that could because uh, here if that's u1, u2, and if by chance v1 is equal to v2, which is possible, uh, if you're going to uh, do that, you're going to do that and that. So in that case, uh, that's okay. But uh, all, the, all the names uh, could be reversed. So I could also propose that change. Whoa, la la. That change. And in this case, that creates that change. So I've 
in the loop. This is not possible. I cannot do that. And maybe uh, my yellow and my proposals, they were already existing in the edge list. Okay? I just drew here the, the ones that I picked and the proposed ones, but there are other existing ones. So I have to, to check that I'm not creating multiple uh, uh, edges uh, nor uh, self loops. And this is more efficient because maybe at the end you didn't change much, but that's very unlikely. But at the end, you always have an output. You don't have to, to test something and uh, start again from the beginning. And that's valid. You, uh, you really sample from the distribution. It's most efficient. In fact, what happens is that most of the time, you have an observed graph. And for instance, you count the number of triangles in that observed graph. And you want to know, is this too small or too large to res with respect to some null distribution. Okay, for the null distribution, I can consider the fixed degree distribution, which is, I consider that uh, that graph is one graph possible among all the possible graphs with the same degree distribution. Okay, that's my null. And then I do many simulations with the rewiring algorithm, I generate a number large number of graphs that have exactly the same uh, de uh, degree distribution as my observed graph. In each of these graphs, I compute the number of triangles. And then I compare the number in the original triangle with the distribution of all those numbers of triangles. And I see if it's too small or too large. So that gives me a test, a practical test. OK? So that's very much used. So, matching versus rewiring. Matching algorithm does not necessarily create a simple graph before the final test, and so you can wait a long time for having a, a, a graph. If the produced graph is not simple, it must be discarded and we draw a new one that's very inefficient. A naive correction of this algorithm, which would verify that uh, i is not equal to j, so no self-loop, or that the edge uh, ij does not exist yet, may either not converge or give biased sampling from all the possible graphs. So you cannot do a naive correction of the matching algorithm. And rewiring algorithm is more efficient, but it works only from an already existing graph, which has the sequence of degrees that you aim at. And in addition, it requires to set the number of iterations. So there's no rule, but empirically, people do 100 times the number of edges in the graph. So you take the number of edges and you multiply this by 100 and that's the number of iteration. That's an empirical rule. Okay. So, so for, for uh, I miss, I think, uh, yeah, sure. this uh, rewind uh, algorithm, you started with uh, a graph mm. uh, which just uh, has a fixed degree. Uh, it has a degree, degree yes, that I aim at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the matching, I just need the degree sequence. So no prior realization of the links. But this algorithm does not, uh, does not provide any uniform distribution. It does. It, it has been proven. I don't know nothing about the proof because this is in the computer science literature. But, but the number of uh, operations that we have is uh, limited. Yeah. It should be uh, great. So maybe there are conditions on uh, the number of iterations, etc. But this is uh, both both algorithms, the matching and the rewiring. They are valid algorithms to generate from the fixed degree distribution. So uniformly from all the possible graphs with that degree distribution. Yeah, it has been proved. I don't know how it works. Huh? Okay, so the behavior of that model can be studied using uh, expensive numerical simulation. So the, the, the only problem is uh, the, the expensive numerical simulation because you have to uh, run many, many uh, uh, simulations. You need to, to have a large number of graphs with those characteristics. So that's what, uh, what I just said in order to test the significance of a statistic, let it be the number of triangles of anything else. That you, that you measure on your graph, 
you define uh, the null, oh, I have many typos, in fact, huh? the null model H0 as the hypothesis fixed degree, uh, and you simulate a large number of graphs under H0 using the rewiring algorithm because it's most efficient. Then you obtain a sequence of values for that random variable T and its empirical distribution under H0, and you compare what you had observed on the first graph with the quantile, quantiles of that distribution, and then that gives you a test of whether this value is too large or too small with respect to the null model, which is the fixed degree one. <coughs> is that clear? Yeah? Okay. Preferential attachment. Um, this uh, translates the idea that rich get richer. So it's, um, it's a generative model. It's like a dynamic model where you, you see the creation of the graph from a small graph to a larger graph. So the idea that is that you start with a small initial graph, G uh, naught, uh, which, which has a certain number of nodes and a certain number of edges. And at the, the beginning, you have a degree sequence, D1 at time zero up to D V0, the last node at time zero. And then you will construct an increasing sequence of graph. Uh, at each time t, you will add nodes and links to that graph. How do you do that? So at each time step t, you add a new node it with a certain degree m, which is a parameter of the model. You add it to the set of nodes. So the, the set of nodes v at time t is, is just the set of nodes at the previous time union this new node. So you just add one node uh, at each time step. And this new node, you will need to put connections between this new node and the former nodes. So it will connect with n existing nodes because you choose the, uh, this new node to be added with a certain degree m and m is fixed. So you, you connect it with m existing nodes and you choose those nodes with a probability that depends on their degree at the previous time. So the nodes in the graph, in the, in the current graph that have the largest degree, they are more likely to get connected to the new arriving node. That's the idea of rich get richer. If you create your web page, you will probably put a link to, I don't know, Google, because uh, this is uh, then easy to just go there and, uh, and link, to USP, to email department, because uh, this is a hub, uh, okay, let's say, uh, on the web page, etc. So you, if you are arriving, you will probably start to connect with uh, the most, uh, uh, well-known people, okay? So that's really this idea. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, there are um, there are people that have uh, studied the behavior of the degree distribution under this model, and with certain conditions on the parameter, you can obtain. A uh, heavy tail distribution, so there will be ups. Yeah, so that's why it's interesting. It's because under certain conditions on the parameter, you create uh, heavy tail, even power law, I think, distribution. You can create power law distribution for the degrees, so that makes sense. Um, and then, okay, so just to finish there, so you, you, you connect with the existing nodes with a probability that is proportional to their degree, and then you update the degrees for the next uh, step. And at the final time step T, the graph has a total of capital uh, V naught, uh, the cardinality of V naught, the initial number of nodes you started with, plus T, the number of nodes you added uh, at each time step, and the number of edges is uh, um, the number of edges you started with plus t times m, because at each time step you added m links. So you have a, a complete characterization. If you, if you aim at generating uh, an edge, uh, a graph with, say, 100 nodes, 
and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, 500 edges, then you just set the time and the, uh, the value of m to obtain these at the end of your algorithm. Okay, I see uh, many disadvantages <laughs> of this uh, preferential attachment model. Uh, one of the advantages is that it's a dynamic generative model that you can use to simulate da data. It's very easy to construct a graph in this way. Uh, under certain conditions, the degree distribution of the graph will follow a power law. So that's realistic in some sense, more realistic than Erdős-Rényi. The problem is with the choice of the parameters. What is the graph that you choose from? What is the value of the, the m, the number of edges you add uh, at some uh, at each uh, iteration? Uh, how do you decide that you stop the iterations? And one of the questions is: Does this impact the? Does this have an impact on the on the graph you obtain at the very end? It's unclear. Or you can tune, or, or if you just tune those parameters, what it changes exactly in the graphs. So it's more like engineer-like uh, thing. And the, the characterization of the result is quite difficult to obtain from a mathematical point of view. And so from a statistical point of view also, this is not a model that you can fit to the data. So you, you, if, you, if I observe a graph, I cannot say, okay, this graph has been generated by this initial core, the G0, uh, in a certain amount of time by adding uh, m at uh, value, uh, m at links uh, at each time step. I have no idea. So I need to, to see uh, some evolution of the graph in order to be able to, to fit something. You see? So that's, that's a bit complicated. So I cannot work from a statistical point of view with that. Yes? But you know a set of probabilities that could be, you do not want that when, how it was created, but you can narrow a little bit, no? Uh, about like how it is, the, those narrow. values? You can narrow a little bit, sorry about because I, I don't know. I'm seeing the problem. I don't know if I can narrow enough that it would be so so I know there's uh, there's at least one statistical paper estimating something in the preferential attachment model uh, I know one and I have to admit that I didn't read it and I don't remember what they do exactly so so there are things you can do you can maybe narrow a little bit but okay in practice it's not um, yeah Okay. But uh, the degree is a formula for for the gamma. I um ah oh, yeah, that's a good point. So I think maybe the that statistical paper that I mentioned, it was trying to uh to characterize the gamma and then get back to uh to some part of those parameters of the model. Maybe that's the way they did. Yeah, I think. But. Okay, that, that's quite complicated. Okay, exponential random graph model. Um, so this, um, this is the, the say, the, the most statistical model, I would say. Um, okay. So um, e exponential random graph, the, the names comes from uh, exponential family of distributions, okay, in statistics. So the idea is that you take an integer n and you consider a n the set of binary adjacency matrices, which they can be symmetric or not, with size n times n. And for any matrix, a potential adjacency matrix, uh, you consider a set uh, of uh, statistics, so a, a set of descriptors, S of A, uh, and it's a vector. You can have P different descriptors of your adjacency matrix. So something, some quantities that you measure on the adjacency matrix. So it's a vector of statistics of the graph, so we'll see some examples uh, of statistics that you can choose in practice. 
And the exp exponential random graph model, uh, it depends on this parameter S of statistics of the graph. And it's defined by the probability distribution P theta over this set of adjacency matrices defined in this way. The probability that a specific uh, graph or adjacency matrix that's the same, prob the probability that a specific graph appears, it's proportional to exponential of theta transpose SA. So that's really the idea of exponential family uh, in probability, where you say that, okay, uh, this is the descript these are the descriptors of my, uh, my uh, model, and the probability uh, that this specific graph appeared, it only depends on the values of the descriptors. So if I have two graphs that have exactly the same values of the descriptors, then they are the same probability to appear. You see? So here, uh, that C theta, it's a sort of normalizing constant. And uh, in practice, you cannot compute it because it's a sum over all possible graphs of those quantities. So that's a huge sum. But there are plenty of methods uh, in statistics to deal with probability distribution known up to a normalizing constant. You just do like Gibbs sampling, things like that. Uh, and you, you can get rid of the problem of this normalizing constant being unknown. So in practice, what can you choose uh, for uh, the vector of descriptors S? So our first comment, uh, S of A automatically becomes a vector of exhaustive statistics. So in the terminology of statistics, an exhaustive statistics is something that uh, capture entirely the characteristics of the observation and the probability that you observe that only depend on those characteristics. So by the very definition of the probability, the fact that it depends only on S of A, that makes that, that implies that S of A is automatically an exhaustive statistics uh, for the model. So all graphs having the same observed value as uh, have the same probability of occurrence under this Erdős-Rényi uh, graph model. Uh, not Erdős-Rényi, sorry, exponential random graph model. So in practice, uh, for SA, you can think of the number of edges, because that's the first important characteristic of the graph. Then you could think of adding the number of triangles, the number of K stars, and you could also, that's important, think of adding covariates uh, of the model. So for instance, if you have a graph where you have additional information on the nodes or on the edges, you can put all that in that uh, exhaustive statistic S of A. And from the modeling point of view, then that's quite interesting to have these covariates in the model. OK, so the, the simplest example that you could think of is just taking uh, S naught. I call it S naught because this is my first example. S naught of A, I just take uh, the, the matrix itself. So all the values of AIJ. And this vec is just to make it vectorize, OK? So if I put in S exactly all the entries of my adjacency matrix, then I uh, observe that the resulting model, the probability uh, of A, it's proportional to exponential sum over ij, theta ij, ij, OK? Because I had theta transpose times S of A, but S of A is all the values of ij. So I obtain this characterization. And in fact, uh, if the random variables ij are independent and non-identically distributed with a Bernoulli distribution with a certain parameter pij. And if I take, uh, sorry, OK, not if. So that corresponds exactly to considering that the ij are independent. Because you see, the, the probability distribution it's the exponential of this sum, so it makes a product. 
it's, a pro uh, it's the product of, uh, of different terms. So uh, all the IIJ will be independent, and, uh, but they are not identically distributed. They can only be Bernoulli, because again, it's a zero one variable. And if you make a small computation, you would see that the value of the parameter implied by this formula is that one. So in fact, there's a direct link between that theta ij and the probability of appearance of a link between i and j. Okay, that's a small computation that you can do. So if you take this very simple uh, statistic, which contains exactly all the entries of the adjacency uh, matrix, then you go back to uh, a model with iid uh, edges, not independent edges, non-identically uh, distributed, Bernoulli with specific parameter uh, pij. Okay, um, in that case, the model has as many parameters as observations. Okay, so you cannot fit it statistically. So that's a probabilistic model, but you cannot hope to estimate the values of the pi ij by just observing one IAJ. Okay, a particular case of this first simple example is when we moreover impose the constraint that all the theta IJ should be constant. Then we obtain, we go back to the Erdős-Rényi model, and the statistic is just the sum of the IIJ, so that's the number of edges. So another way uh, to see it is that if you take as uh, the statistic, the number of edges in the graph, then you go back to Erdős-Rényi model. And in this case, you can see that uh, a value, um, uh, the, the maximum likelihood estimator for P, the probability of connecting any two nodes, it's equal to uh, the sum of the IIJ divided by n, n minus 1 divided by 2. This is the observed density in the graph. Okay, we already saw that. So if you have an Erdős-Rényi model, the parameter p of the Erdős-Rényi model, it's estimated, at least from the maximum likelihood point of view, by just the density in the graph. Okay? Let's go to a less elementary example. If I consider S of A being the same as before, S1 is the sum of the IIJ, so the number of edges in my graph, and now I am adding S2, which is the sum of IIJ, IIK. So I look at all the triples that are connected. Okay, I look at how many uh, uh, things like that, objects like that I have in my graph, and I say nothing about that edge. It could be there or not. So when I uh, input that into the model, then uh, the random variables under this uh, Erdős, uh, no, not Erdős, exponential random graph model, they are non-independent anymore because of this product. I cannot uh, split them uh, apart. And there is no analytical expression for the maximum likelihood estimator. So in this case, uh, I, have, uh, I have two parameters, a theta 1 in front of this value, a theta 2 in front of this value, but I cannot express theta 1 at maximum likelihood estimator equals something, theta 2 at equals something. Uh, more generally, uh, for uh, any integer k larger than 1, you can look at SK, the number of K stars. So this is a two star, in fact. And uh, this will be a star, this will be a star, etc. So you can look at SK of A, the number of K stars, and the number of triangles. So the number of triangles is obtained like that. You ask, so this is non null if. Uh, all these values are 1, so if there is a triangle between i, uh, j, and k. So here you are counting the number of triangles. Then uh, what are called Markov random graphs. These are exponential random graphs where the, the exhaustive statistic that you use is S1 
So S1 is the number of edges, and in fact, the, the number of edges that. So you take S1, S2, S3, up to S n minus 1. So you, you look at all the possible stars of any possible dimension in your graph, mm. and you add the number of triangles, and that gives you Markov random graphs. You cannot work with that because uh, S n minus 1, that's too big. So that's a theoretical model. You cannot work with it in practice. So in practice, what you do is that you don't consider uh, this model up to k equal n minus 1, and you use uh, a very small value of k, like, I don't know, k equals to uh, 2, 3 at maximum. And then you, you look at the number of edges, the number of connected triples, the number of three stars, and the number of triangles, and that's all, and that's already very much. And people work with that, plus covariates, because that's the, the main interesting point in this uh, exponential or random graph model is that you can add covariates. OK, problems. I don't like air games. There are not many things that I like. I'm, I'm French, so I'm, I'm very uh, critical about everything. Um, the constant C theta may not be computed, but parameter estimation methods based on MCMC with, for instance, Gibbs sampling will get rid of that issue. So that's not the main issue. That's an issue. You should have it in mind, but we have tools to deal with that. Maximization of the likelihood in ergum is a very difficult problem, and in fact, it has been proved uh, from uh, probabilists that it is ill-posed. In fact, these models, they often degenerate in the sense that either they concentrate all the mass on the, of the distribution on the complete graph or on the empty graph or on a mixture of these two extremes. So, in fact, as soon as you don't put very simple statistics, like just the number of uh, edges, and then you, you have a very independent Bernoulli model, very simple. Uh, as soon as you want to put a little bit of statistics in that, then, in fact, the, the model will either concentrate on, on, on uh, charging the complete graph or the, the empty graph or a mixture of that, and so you, you have almost no graph that can appear under those conditions. And so, in fact, uh, there, are, there are very nice statisticians that do maximum likelihood uh, estimation in the ergums, and that's really difficult. I don't know how they, they, they obtain uh, uh, results, but they, they do have some things, but that's really tricky, that's really complicated to deal with, and I don't like them, I don't recommend to use them. But that's, that's very specific to me. Huh? I show them to you uh, anyway. Okay, uh, last one, the latent position model, and then we will finish with that because uh, it's already a lot. And uh, I, I told you we could have a break, but I'm not making a break, I'm sorry. You should rebel. Okay, the latent position model, uh, it was suggested uh, by studies in social networks. And uh, in that model, you have latent variables uh, that I will call ZI. So latent in statistics, it just means non-observed, okay? So I have a, a random variable at each node i, zi, which is unobserved, and it's associated with uh, each node. And I will say, OK, it lives in the space, say, r square, so, because the model has been defined with uh, the zi in r p, but in practice, you just p use p equal to. So it lives in r square. And um, this uh, latent space, it represents a social space. So the idea is that the way you will connect in the graph, um, it has to deal with your own characteristics, whether uh, you, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, frequent uh, that academy X, uh, that uh, academia, como se dice in Portuguese, Alma academia. So I don't know the word in English, but you, you understand. The? No, I was thinking of going to the gym, uh, thing like that. So if you have a, Academy. 
Yeah, okay, academy. So, uh, if you go to an academy, then you, you'll have social acquaintances there. Uh, if you have a specific job, you have... Uh, and so, all those characteristics, uh, the idea of this model is that they can be captured uh, by uh, that la latent space, which uh, you do not observe. But uh, if, you, if the two individuals are close in that latent space, then they will tend to have a link in the graph, to be connected, to be, uh, to be friends in the, in the social network. So that's really that, that idea. The proximity of individuals in that latent space will induce a greater probability of connection in the graph. So only the relative position of the latent variables between them is important for the model and not the absolute position, uh, of course, okay? Only the distance or the relative positions between each of them. So that's the main idea. And to define it properly, uh, it's like that. You consider an undirected binary graph given by that adjacency matrix. You can have uh, possibly uh, covariate vectors on uh, each uh, link, x, i, j, uh, on each relation. And then you use a logistic regression model where you uh, say, okay, the log it of the probability that I have a connection between i, a, j, given the latent position of node i, the latent position of node j, and the covariates of their relation. So that's just the definition of the function log it. Okay, so I, uh, the model says that the log it of that object is simply a function of a constant term, which basically will, uh, will have to deal with the, the global density of the graph, plus a term that depends on the covariates. Okay, so the covariates can influence the probability that you will, uh, you will connect, minus the distance, the Euclidean distance in that latent space between i and j. So the closer you are in the latent space, the uh, larger will be the probability of connection in the social network. So the model parameters here, alpha and beta, the alpha parameter adjusts for the density of the graph. We can replace the Euclidean norm with any distance, okay, but doesn't change many things. The variable zi can only be reconstructed up to rotation, ax axial symmetry, and translation. Close, okay, I have many typos. You, you, you know what I did? So, uh, my, my course is in French. I took the French, I put it in Google Translate, copy paste, copy paste, copy paste before coming here, and I didn't read everything. But I will clean that. No, ChatGPT is worse. I tried it. ChatGPT changes the LaTeX formula. That's awful. Google Translate didn't. So I was, uh, I was mad with ChatGPT. It changed the LaTeX formula. That was awful. Because here you just copy paste whatever the LaTeX, the LaTeX will be the same in Google Translate. That's cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, there's an R package uh, called LatentNet that proposes a Bayesian inference procedure in this model. That's quite cool to, uh, to test. It's really interesting. Um, I don't know if I put it in the practical session. I, I don't remember. You, you, you'll check. Oh, okay. For next Monday, you have the practical session available on the mini page uh, of the course. You should prepare it. Okay? Because you have all the weekend to do that. I am visiting Sao Paulo, but you already know the place. Huh? Um, okay, and that's all. Okay, maybe I can add a few words about that. Um, from the statistical point of view, um, the critics again, still uh, the French side uh, uh, in me. Um, why, why R2? Okay, why not another dimension? That's one of the, of the problems, because uh, why would you think that it's sufficient to be in dimension two to capture uh, all this latent information? Maybe it's sufficient, but uh, from the statistical point of view, it's a bit uh, not completely satisfying. Another thing that I could have had here, and I, uh, I'm taking the, the fact that uh, uh, we still have time, 
Oh, I'm adding that. Uh, what you can do uh, when you have uh, reconstructed uh, the latent positions, uh, so you have your, uh, your graph and uh, you have reconstructed the latent positions, so maybe you have your latent positions like that. These are the ZIs. Uh, you, couldn't, you can use, uh, after that, the latent positions to do uh, clustering. So here, we could use uh, Gaussian mixtures uh, in a, in a two-dimensional space, um, maybe to get that this is a first Gaussian, uh, this is a second one, and this is another one. And maybe you have three groups in uh, your set of uh, objects. So, um, this, uh, th this has been proposed in the literature to combine this latent space model plus this clustering. So you, on top of that, you, you put a, a mixture model on the ZI and you obtain directly uh, different clusters. And there uh, you can, uh, um, you can, then you, you can choose uh, the number of clusters with um, statistical model selection but the, the dimension of the space is always fixed. There are no, I, I know no approach uh, from, the, from the statistical perspective to, uh, to do dimension, yeah. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a good point, I, I don't know, but uh, it's like when you, th there are many latent space models in statistics and, uh, and uh, the choice of the dimension of the latent space, when it's continuous, it's never tackled from, uh, from a statistical cr a criterion. And I don't know what's the, the main uh, problem here. We can think of that for next year. But we have other problems to solve first. Um, okay, uh, since I have some time, um, a last model, it's my favorite one. And I didn't put it here because I thought I would not uh, have time to, to describe it, but let me describe it now. That's the stochastic block model. you'll have all the information. Stochastic block variables, there are no more continuous, they are discrete. So you consider Z1, Zn, Iid, exactly like in the latent space model, but they do not live in R square or in Rp. They live in some uh, finite on to P. So there are uh, K groups, K different groups, and then you assume that um, the IAJ conditional on the ZI, they are independent. It's just a conditional independence, okay? It's not an independence. So, because you don't know that, the resulting IIJ, the AIJ, they are dependent. And you further model the probability distribution of IIJ knowing, given all the values of Z1, Zn. You say, okay, to decide whether I will link the two nodes IIJ, uh, um, I and J, I only need the information group of node J, and this will be always a Bernoulli distribution, okay? So it's a Bernoulli with some parameter that will depend on the value of the groups. So this is a model that goes in between the Erdős-Rényi model. The Erdős-Rényi model, it's not good because the P is the same for everyone. So it's too homogeneous. 
and the random graphs that you observe, they are not homogeneous, okay? They are uh, places where you have more links and places where you have less links. And we saw the other extreme where we say that all the R, A, I, J, they follow a Bernoulli distribution with a parameter P, I, J, that was specific to uh, that link. And this one, you can not work with it because from the statistical point of view, you have just one observation per, per parameter and you cannot do that. And the stochastic block model gives you a compromise because it will say, okay, in fact, uh, nodes, they are grouped together in uh, clusters and uh, inside the same clusters, the individuals, they behave the same. Their probability to link to someone else, it only depends on the cluster they belong to. And then here, uh, you can do inference, statistical inference in that model, because for any of these parameters, you have repetition. There are many individuals in the same group. And so there are inference procedure to estimate those latent clusters and the corresponding probability uh, uh, with, uh, between those clusters. And it's also a way of uh, describing your data in, um, uh, in, a, in a more concise way. It summarizes the data because if you look at all the individuals and the way they connect to each other, if you look at a particular connection, you can say nothing about it. It will just be different from the, from the other one. But if you look uh, a little bit, uh, if you zoom out the graph and say, okay, this group of nodes, they all behave the same and they have a large probability of connection with that other group of nodes. It's a zooming out of the graph and it's a characterization at a um, uh, larger, um, le, uh, higher level of the, of the graph and of the description of its behavior. So using clustering in the graph helps you interpret uh, the data in a statistical way. So that's the best model. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> okay, I'm finished. Do you have questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Between, between stochastic block model and community detection? No. no. Community detection and clustering in the, in, the, in the general approach. Clustering meaning that you want to cluster uh, points in R2, for example. Because when you have clusters, you have points in the space and you want to uh, uh, detect the groups, right? Yeah. So, so um, okay, the, the idea uh, in the... That, that's the same because of that. So let me go back to that uh, picture. Yeah. When I'm in the latent space model and on top of it, I do clustering. Then um, I have those groups. And the fact, sorry, there should not be uh, the same number everywhere, but uh, the fact that they are close, their probability of connection will be higher. That's, that's in the model because I had, you see, uh, let me show you the, the, the latent space model of off. So, but, but the latent space model is thought to detect communities. So communities, these are specific clusters with a large within group connection probability and a small between group connection probability. So meaning that you, uh, you tend to connect with the people in the same group as you are, but you connect less with people in other groups. That can be captured by that kind of model, but not necessarily. Here you don't specify that the within group 
uh, probability of connection should be larger than the between group. But in the latent space model of off, you are doing that. Because, because you say that the closer they are in the latent space, the larger will be the probability of connection. And then you do the clusters by the positions. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe we can we can write. So if we look at the latent clusters plus the 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 clusters here, and we go back to the probabilities in the latent space. Yeah, maybe we could write the link between those objects and the the parameters. Uh, yeah. Here, here it's uh, no uh, discrete. I have k different values. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. I don't know if it has been looked at. I've never seen that, but you're you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I think I think we can write this model as a specific case of the stochastic block model. That would be interesting. But then you should wait to the to the further uh, theoretical talk because that would be about spectral clustering and I start from data points, construct a similarity matrix, and then do the spectral clustering. Is that what you are asking also or not? Uh, okay, but the spec there <gasps> because yeah. they are not really connected to the other part of the graph and I guess you, you can see that if you, if you see in, in R2 it looks like the same but at least what drives mathematically is different right? Mm -hmm. we, we'll discuss that <laughs> yeah so you were saying that K is known or you can estimate it. She's working on that. She has very nice results about uh, statistical estimation of K that is consistent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, one last question. I don't know if it's uh, it's well with this uh, stuff, but. Is it common to do diagnostic analysis on graphical models? Like, okay, I know how to fit. Sure, the model, but sure. How I check if it's fed. Yeah. It's very common in regression, but I usually don't see it in graphical models. So, so when, when you mean a um, uh, uh, check, is like testing if the graph follows that distribution? Oh, no? For instance, regression, it's for regression. You mm -hmm. check. Yeah, yeah, you check for the normality of the residual. So here what you will do, you, you can have goodness of fit test to, uh, to um, decide whether 
uh, the graph follows a specific uh, distribution versus another one. So depending on the model, depending on the assumptions, that exists. But that's quite difficult. But that exists, yeah. And not in all the cases. OK, thank you all. And have a nice weekend. No,